I'd like to call tonight's meeting to order Kathleen Allen, Brian Chetney, here. Tom Chapa, here. Heather Del Conte, here. Brandon Legault, Linda Serena, here. Samuel Tripp, here. and Ruma Kawaja. Here. If you would all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Next on the agenda is the floor to the public. We have two speakers signed up for tonight. Please remember there is a three minute limit. If we could have Sean Kalen come up to the front, please. Good evening. Thanks for the time. Um, here tonight just to talk about and maybe request um, some improved communication and give an example, uh, something that happened recently. Some of you may or may not be aware that uh, recently we worked together with the school district, we, the Buck Boosters, to help with school spirit and put uh, in Leighton Gymnasium uh, Crow's Nest. We came up with a theme, uh, calling it the Crow's Nest, kind of affiliated with the Buccaneers, and thought this could be the student section. Uh, a lot of times when we go to other gyms and such, they have a student section, they have a theme, a name, and so we wanted to bring that for our students and the student athletes but really the student body. And uh, we uh, worked with uh, Dr. Guai, got that approved, got that up there. Um, additionally, uh, the next step in that is that um, we actually learned of a grant through the uh, Garrett Dunsmore Memorial Foundation. And so we thought it would be a great opportunity, obviously with Garrett being an alumni, um, that we could request uh, for funding and add on to what we did with the crow's nest. So the idea was that we were going to get t-shirts made uh, with the with the uh, Garrett Dunsmore Memorial Foundation logo, a buck, and we had Step One Creative put a, uh, together a logo. It kind of fits what high schoolers might wear, you know, we, you know, maybe not something we would wear, but we thought about it and we had it proposed um, so the Garrett Dunsmore Memorial Foundation was time sensitive uh, and we also wanted to put their logo up where the crow's nest was. So I had to put in another request to Dr. Guai and I did that initially on Monday, December 9th. Uh, gave him some background and such on what we wanted to do and uh, that it was time sensitive. Uh, sent a second request because I'm in business and I understand and, and understand how busy everybody is. So just a second request sent on December 18th, um, reiterating that it was time sensitive, the basketball seasons are passing us by, and we needed to get approval before we would get approval from the foundation uh, for the ask that we put in. Um, so just, you know, those were the, those were the two dates. Uh, I didn't hear anything back, so I reached out to Linda, and I appreciate that she took the time uh, just to try to give me some direction on how I could get an answer slash approval um, for the additional logo over at Layton School. Um, so we talked, and again, thank you, Linda, for the time there. And so then subsequently, uh, a couple days later, uh, I did finally receive um, you know, approval from Dr. Guai, which, I, which we appreciate. Um, and I appreciate Heather closing the loop, totally closed the loop. Uh, said that I should see an email from Dr. Guai, and you know if I need anything else, please, the communication's open. My, my concern is that I just can't put my arms around how long it took on, on something where the Buck Boosters are vo 13 volunteers that are trying to do good. And I think that hopefully most of you know what we're trying to do for the student body, for our student athletes, to bring every toge everybody together. Um, how it takes so long to get an answer on something that's so good. And if it's not good, or if, we, if it's disapproved, then just let us know. But we're a volunteer group collaborating with another foundation in our, in our great community, a very important foundation, a new foundation, to try to come together to, for, for a positive thing in our school district. And it, it takes over three weeks to get approval for something that, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, the Buck Booster Board and myself representing the Buck Booster Board think it was a very positive uh, request and something that we're trying to do. So it's concerning, 
Uh, we need to treat, we need to all work together to continue to, continue to try to do good for our students uh, in the Oswego City School District. And I have expectations, I guess, that a more immediate response would have been very much appreciated. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Sean. Next is Jim McKenzie. Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, I'll try to keep it short, three minutes is done, but I'm not gonna need it. Uh, I just wanted to start by thanking everybody for taking all the time throughout this process. I know that sometimes, as was said, I can send emails to remind, just to make sure that things are being kept up with. I'm not in business, but I'm in education and I deal with students, so reminders are good a lot of the times. Um, I also want to, I hope, Ms. Serena, I hope you saw the uh, minutes from the last meeting, but just in case, you know, to reiterate that it's not just me here. Um, the petition has now 56 signatures, um, specifically asking that the district not use Tiger Crumb River for all the reasons I've talked about before. I won't go into all those again. What I do want to say is one thing that was mentioned in the last meeting that I've heard a lot of times in budgets, and I get this a lot because I deal with budgets myself, and it's a common saying of, if we do this, then we won't be able to do something else. Money comes from someplace, money must come from someplace else. And while I do appreciate that, sometimes I think that is taken by some who may not know the process as, well, something we'll do without. And in projects like this, I don't believe that to always be true or have to be true. I do know that this budget has millions of dollars of money that was budgeted into it just for contingencies that you did not foresee when it was originally proposed. That's the way all these budgets are written. And if you look at our last three capital projects, we've all come in under budget. I think it's wonderful. I think that really shows what our past administrations and boards have been able to do with that. If you take the last big budget that was somewhere $48 million, it was $700,000 left over. So when I look at this and I look at the information that was turned in at the last meeting that you were all able to review with different alternative infills, to me, in reviewing those, I personally, for what my two cents is worth, think it's worth the extra money for either organic or something like the Brock fill. I do understand that in those notes that there are things about mold, all right, and I don't know a lot about it, although I spent a lot of time looking it up and I really haven't found people complaining, which makes me wonder why not? Usually people, especially on the internet, complain a lot. What I did learn is that artificial turf, regardless of infill, is going to have to have mold control because as I didn't think about, flies and pollen and grass and everything else that goes into there while maybe swept up, it seems from my reading as though there's a lot of mold control anyway. So would you need more with an organic infill? Possibly. I will say that the Brock fill that has been presented to the committee to the board here, the Brock fill's website specifically says it will not grow mold. No. I don't know if they aren't offer a money back guarantee. That'd be nice to know. <laughs> But it doesn't. For those districts who um, it's been mentioned in the last meeting, I don't know if Mrs. Bullard or anybody else has had a chance to look into and talk with other districts, but I wonder now that they've had it for years now, if organic infill, if they've had mold problems, what they do. Again, not an expert, so I'd be interested to know what they have done through their own experiences. But it does seem that no matter which way you go, you're going to have to do some. So, well, honestly, after looking about this, talking to all of these people, especially a lot of people that signed that petition, there were 56 people who signed the petition, I really wish that the group would have gone with real, well-drained, really well-designed, real grass. I think that would have solved a lot of things, but if that is not the case, I just reiterate the wishes of myself and those others who signed the petition, and I know there's a lot more people out there. Uh, just don't use trushed up tires. We sit in an ecologically unique watershed. We don't need to be putting any amount of toxins into that. We don't need to be exposing kids at all when it's unnecessary. So again, thank you for your time. And I do appreciate you taking the time for all this discussion. Thanks. Next on the agenda is the Board of Education. And I'll turn it over to Heather Del Conte and the Superintendent of Schools for discussion on a couple of items. So first of all, thanks for Everyone. Even though we're not doing, um, we're not going to necessarily uh, vote on anything. These uh, four topics are things that are kind of have been hanging out there for a long time. I think we do need to get some resolution on them. And um, so I guess we'll start with number one, the turf discussion, which can roll right off of Jim's comments there. And um, we did have the presentation um, last 
time, and I think we learned a lot of things. Um, hopefully, people kind of got a gut feeling after that, so I'll just kind of open that up to what people are thinking after hearing all the information, and um, yeah. Are you talking about the six items that you sent out creating educational excellence? No no no, 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 no. We're talking about this. Is are you on the agenda? We're on this, Linda. <clears throat> we're on item number one, which is discussion about artificial turf. Oh, okay. Do you, want, do you have an agenda? Right there, Hi. yeah. Right there. Right here? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So. Second page number one. Oh, thank you. Yep. Heather, she also gets the handout. We probably please. should. She please. has it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the legal document. It's a list of the... Um, those are the yeah, list of the options just, that we have, um, other options, mm -hmm. and they were thoroughly discussed at the last mm -hmm. meeting. <coughs> That's the agenda from yeah. last time. She wasn't well, here. Leave, 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 leave that. And then get a fresh one. This is for We have four discussion time. Oh, that's why I'm confused. <laughs> and I, can't get on my... You can't, no, I know. There's some handouts on her from the last presentation. Oh, okay. And we okay. should probably point out that Corey is here. He's he's okay. our landscape engineer, architect, and uh, Craig is also here. So as long as you're, here. you're here... So they can engage with yeah, us as well. You want to come even closer? That's fine, but um, couple chairs we didn't right? discuss last time well-drained grass like keeping it grass and, and just designing the drainage and, and perhaps having some um, extra money aside for if we have to re-turf. I don't know, really know how it works, but. We, we talked about natural grass kind of along the entire process. Sure. Um, the problem with natural grass is that you're limited on how many uses you can have on that field. You're limited to the number of hours. Um, so you're looking at, you know, most you would be having would be about 30 events per season. And an event is a two-hour period. So a two-hour period, it doesn't matter if it's a game, a practice, PE class, marching band practice, whatever. If you're on that field for two hours, that's one event. Once you go over that number, that's when you start overusing the field. It's getting compacted quicker. It, you know, your the roots are getting, you know, basically tightened up, everything. So that's where you have to get into more what they call aggressive maintenance. You have to get into field rotation where you leave a field offline and you know for a year and you practice everywhere else and then that field comes online the next year and one goes down. And looking at all of the sports that you offer to the kids, which is great. I mean, you, you offer significant opportunities between varsity, JV, modified, club, you know, community, all of those, you don't have enough field space to be able to have all those teams have a place for games, practice, and be able to take fields offline at the same time. So that's when the, the decision, you know, you guys made, you know, a <coughs> few months ago to go with artificial turf came from. Um, and then what we did last May is we just kind of went through, you know, there are alternatives, here are some alternative, you know, the, the options that are out there, pros and cons of each one. Um, and I do have my goodie bag of different infills again. I left it in my car because that box is kind of heavy, so I didn't want to bring it if I didn't need to. <laughs> yeah. What is the organic? Is it still rubber or is it still? So the organics vary. It, it's, you can have 100% cork. You can have um, softwoods. You can have walnut, which the process that it goes through, it basically it, it makes it so it's, it's an allergen-free product. You can have corn husks olive shells there's a variety to them who's used it uh, around here nobody compaction uh, compaction on it for athletes for it's not been tested, it's not been been tested. tested enough years um, I talked to all the three manufacturers that we kind of work with the most that are the <coughs> most installs in New York State um, the only ones that are really doing alternative infills is when you start going down to Long Island um, in New York City that's about it um, and they have not seen an increase in organics. What they have seen is a decrease in alternative infills. So ones that have alternative infills are going away from them now because of the, the performance that they've seen more. You gotta remember when 
some of these fields for first going in and alternative infills were discussed, <coughs> they were only like a year old. Um, and some of the information that we got up until like last week's meeting, you know, Brock, for example, that infill in the United States, it's been in for a couple of years. It's not, it's not time tested. Um, organics, you know, you're talking a couple of years in, in the New York area. Overseas, it's different. Europe, it's different, but they have different standards than we have, different climates, everything else, and also for performance is different as to what is recommended by the American Sports Builders Association, um, you know, and those are in National Federation of High School Sports, those are organizations that, that we have to follow. The concerns the gentleman over here has, have we, have we adopted a program to sanitize our fields and, and maintain our fields if we're going to put this turf field in? Have we, have we had that? Professional advice as far as what we do to there. There is a company that you can they will They will treat pre-treat your carpet with basically a, a disinfectant um, The problem is is that once it's installed, there's no way to re-disinfect it. It's primarily used for indoor sports um, why Indoor turf you, fields. Why can't you? Like your water in a grass field. Why can't you water and put chlorine? Chlorine would, irrigation system. chlorine would, you can put out an irrigation system, but irrigating artificial turf fields, it's about a $120,000 investment that most, most school districts, I've done five of them, where they have, have actually asked for some sort of a water system to be able to cool the field, or <coughs> it down, three out of those five are still shrink wrapped and have never been used. When you're talking about disinfecting too, I mean, that's not taking care of toxins. Right, right. That, that's a point. Yeah. That you cannot treat the tire rubber to remove the toxins in it. It will naturally just leach out of the field. Into the ground or and Well, it goes into the storm sewers, which would be go, go untreated straight into lake. Allegedly. Again, there's not enough reporting and testing that's been officially done to well, a scientific level that is publishable. I, I will disagree wholeheartedly with that, or I would have never been here. And but what I, I can say is that are the amounts of high enough to be of importance to people who care as an environmental scientist my level zero when you can help it osha if you're working with things in a factory setting is very different but every scientific study that i've seen says that it does leach out including the most recent epa studies they do volatilize out both at ambient air temperature and at 60 degrees at measurable levels. Again, are the levels so high? What I say is that for something like the heavy metal lead, the first line of New York State Department of Health reads, there is no acceptable exposure lead level. None. I've been studying it now for 13 years. When I started, the level that was considered bad in humans and blood was, we'll call it 10. This year, it just changed to five. I guess it will keep going down as information is known. So I will, again, I've always said, we don't know if it's going to directly cause cancer in people. We don't know if it's going to kill all the fish. We do know that it's there. We do know where's, that it will stick. Where's our drainage go now? Does it go to the retention pond that's designed? Does it, go it goes into a holding cell underneath and it's distributed through the storm system at a controlled rate. So it's not like a leach field first and then no, no. So it goes no, right into the soil. natural filtering through the system, through the soils and the system. Yeah. So I, I'm actually like to hear from some board members as to how you're feeling after <laughs> hearing well, all I of this information. I have one question that Go. may not have much to do with the discussion that they're having. Your petition, are they all Oswego people? I had uh, all but two of them. I had two people that I was at a group meeting from Fulton who really were adamant about signing. Okay. So I, I made sure that they indicated on the position, on the petition, they wrote Fulton on it. All of the other 50 plus are residents of this district. I have a concern because when we went out on the project, um, our community voted for what we presented to them. And I think we're down to the wire here. Am I correct? We have to make That's a decision. That's what we have to make a decision tonight. So we have to make a decision tonight. And you're saying that other districts have had this in for how many years? Like, give me the highest. The oldest one. 
The oldest one. The oldest yes. one, sand, ESM, probably 15. Yeah, probably, probably, well, probably around 10 years. 10 years. Okay. Yeah. That's the sand. And that's an all sand and fill. They're changing right now because of the crap. Functionally not working. We want to know the oldest rubber, rubber and fill. Right. Oh, the oldest rubber and fill, you're going back 20 plus years. I, I would just, I mean, common sense would tell me, and I, you know, I, I'm not here to, you know, I appreciate that you, you're looking out for the environment and, and everything else, but my common sense would tell me there's a lot more rubber tires on the road that's directly right next to the sewer drains. It's not getting leached through, through pea stone and gravel and, and everything else before it gets to that drainage mm -hmm. pipe and goes to a and drainage right. system. And then I think that. I think they're doing sewer separation. I, I would hope that the city would, you know, monitor anything that runs into their drainage system to, to take care of reconditioning water yeah. and everything else that's run off from roads and, and everything else that I, I just, have, for life of me. And, and, and I, I would support, right. and I support grass fields first and foremost, but when you've already gone out to the public with a turf field and the need for turf in the spring is kind of course, important, but maybe right. you could live it. Which, you know, where you're Frank, placing Frank, the could you report on percentage of new uh, multi-purpose fields or stadiums that you work with collaboratively in school districts and the percentage of districts that are moving toward a product like you recommend? We've done two fields in the last 10 years that have used an alternative infill. Our off, actually, and I would say when sand, was, when they were first coming out, turf fields, after the, the, the their, their typical AstroTurf, they started coming out with fields that were about three quarters to an inch high on a pad still, and it had just sand um, infill to it. And then after that, they went to a higher one and a half to two and a half inch high fiber with a sand and rubber in it, and you were kind of getting away from having an E-layer to it. Um, the fields that we have done Personally, we have, not counting those, because that was an old generation, we have, if you count ESM, which is the all sand, we have three. <coughs> and we've done over, we currently are designing our 75th field. That was my next question. And that's all through New York um, and also Northern PA. Or the ESM field originally was a sand infill, correct? Yes. My understanding was they either have pulled it out or they're going to, and replace it with the crumb rubber? Correct. Correct. What's the average lifespan of the, of the rubber, I think we're thinking? Because I, I do know that disposing of it is going to be a significant expense. So crumb rubber is one of the easiest things that they have for recycling. Uh, we just did a replacement at Waterloo last year um, with their crumb rubber and they come in, they, they cut the turf up and it goes through a, it ramps it up and it actually will almost vacuum it out and it puts it in super sack bags of the existing infill. When they put down the new carpet, they put down a new layer of sand, which is not, it's maybe an eighth of an inch. Then they put down the recycled sand and rubber, and then they top it off with new rubber just to get the height, because over time you will lose infill no matter what, just to cleats and uniforms and everything else, so. But, so it's, they, and they do encourage it, we encourage it we you know as long as it's coming from as long as we know what the source was if it was a manufacturer that's no longer in business generally there's a reason why and that would be would be kind of suspect of is to using their field because we don't know where that material came from the process that went through to get you know made but you know out of the manufacturers that we recommend the most we know where the, the source plants are Thanks. Maybe just one real question. Um, and it popped up in my head last meeting, but I had to leave. Has anyone tracked the goalkeepers from 20 years ago on the turf fields? That's how this all started. Is that about the <laughs> one where, in, where the report came <laughs> out? I Washington don't know about a report. Okay. I just, <clears throat> someone had mentioned it to me, so I'm asking the question. There was Has a, it ever been tracked? No, well, there was, there was a, I don't want to call it a publication or an article, it was more of a, it's more of someone kind of coming out saying that in Washington they noticed that goalkeepers there may have been an increase in cancer 
for goalkeepers playing on artificial turf. They did some additional studies to it. Like a real research. Right. If you look at that, it actually came back that there was more cancer-causing agents in the cleats, the gloves that they're wearing, the soccer balls, everything else. And you just answered my question. Then yes, there has been a study done. Thank you. So just to kind of, I, we don't want to, we could probably discuss this forever and ever and ever. I guess what you guys are being asked to do is, is just, just to follow your gut. You've got a lot of information. Um, there aren't any smoking guns. There's not really a definitive um, study out there that's going to show us either way. So you're really asked, being asked right now to use your judgment, your best judgment. Um, anticipate as best you can what might happen, you know, 10 years down the road. And just make your best judgment. I mean, that's that's all we've got. We've been given very good information, and I appreciate from, from all angles. Um, I'm a very conservative person. I tend to... Um, want to really take care of the environment. I also, grass is obviously my first choice as well. I'm not sure that there are, we've been given very many um, exceptional alternatives. So um, that's my feeling, but I'd like to hear everybody else's. You know, <coughs> Heather, I've uh, been following Jim. He's been coming to these meetings, been very open and honest, and, and I've said before, I appreciate his involvement in this whole process. But even he, uh, we've had public meetings, and we had some meetings in the superintendent's office with Jim, and he, even he, he will admit that there's nothing that's definitive. Uh, and since since we've gotten this far, and I've talked to I've talked to coaches uh, that play on, on these fields, uh, I, I don't see any reason for me to, to change what we're, we've already uh, spec'd out and plan to do. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come down to money. But I do disagree with your statement about <coughs> uh, there's always contingency. Yeah, there is contingency. But we're real early in this process, and we could run into a whole bunch of more things to come up over the next five, six years that'll lead up that contingency. So I've got that money in the bank. I'd rather save it. I'm kind of uh, thinking that you know the same framework that Sam is. Um, <clears throat> at this stage, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a feeling? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't exactly see all, all of the pros and cons of each one. Um, I definitely am a big advocate for like saving the environment. So if there really isn't any alternative that would be better, then I think it's good. I'm the same way. In a, a perfect world, and I had seen the original report on. Uh, it was real, real sports when the original uh, show that they did regarding the goalies oh. in Seattle, and uh, and what they had done and the incidents and the level and that they'd gone through and removed a lot of the turf fields and replaced them went back to grass. And that Seattle, it's not here. It, it's a little bit different. I'd be the first one to say I would much rather have um, grass or then an alternative infill. I would like to have that as well if we could. But unfortunately, looking at the realities right now. I'm in the same position. I wanted a definitive. I wanted the EPA. I wanted the DEC to come out with a definitive that said, no, this is definitely a cancer-causing agent. You do not want it there. Um, that would make it much easier. But I think where we are in the process, my thing would be, we have two other fields that are going to come in at a later date that we move forward, but we don't take our eye off the ball in terms of continuing looking at this. And if it comes to the point at those times, we do the alternatives there and potentially replace this one. But I feel like it went to the public. The public's aware of it. That was the vote that was taken. My druthers would be um, natural or an alternative. But where we are right now, I say we have to move forward with it. Can I say one more thing? I think that I want to echo what Sam said. Um, Jim McKenzie's been coming to central office. He's been meeting with the superintendent, district leadership, boards of education, facilities committee made multiple presentations to the Board of Education. And what I appreciate is that you're passionate and informed. You're always gracious and courteous. And um, that that needed to be noted. Absolutely. Well, it looks like we have a majority. I, I again, would prefer the graphs myself. That's my, my very first choice. Right. But. Um, 
And, and as far as the, the vote, I'm not sure that the public had all the information that we have, you well, know, to make an informed vote. The public, so, had voted, on, the public had voted, voted on a turf field, but they were informed of what the infield was. They did were not know. Right. So, so there was I, an unknown there. Yeah. Uh, if that had been laid out originally, who knows? And the planning of this project went over 10 years. Yeah. Right. Oh, at least 10. Yeah. 12. Right. So. 12, I'd say. Okay. Corey, just one more quick question. It has nothing to do with anything, but uh, of, of all the schools, <laughs> where are you laughing at? None of my questions. None of my questions. When uh, of, of the schools that have put in <coughs> turf fields, have any of them gone back to grass or to, to natural grass? Not that we. Uh, the, the, the only project that we have done where they've actually gone back to natural grass was the Lions Bank Stadium. What? Was Alliance Bank Stadium where the Syracuse oh, the Chiefs the Chiefs play that's the only one and um, that they was had a call from the Mets right or yeah that? and they had an original Astro turf field um, high schools colleges um, they're either going to turf or they're staying with where they are you know, not the brush up to me that uh, some of the pro teams pro football teams uh, have gone back to grass fields but the, the argument there is they don't practice on those grass fields. They only yeah. play their games. They practice on Correct. the turf. And so they also, that, that they also have a full grounds crew dedicated to those yeah. fields. Where That's the part I said has nothing to do with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have grass fields, and it sounds to me that the only time we have a problem is the spring, or if there's a significant amount of rain. And so it does seem like drainage is the significant problem, not yeah, necessarily compaction. Spring, and then also the compaction in the fall, like how you play on them all. Um, we did some soil probes where we couldn't even get the, the probe down into the soil. It was so compacted. You know, she got to go through easily through at least four to six inches. And in the fall, we brought into soccer by October here, middle school field's done. Because it's dry, it's desiccated, it's or it's beat up. So, so then you're in Turrell and you might as well play in the parking lot. Well, I appreciate everyone's diligence with that. Okay, <coughs> moving on, uh, APP policy, Rhonda. So just to give a little background on this, uh, we did have a subcommittee meet with Rhonda, and they discussed it, but really felt that it, it um, needed to be a full board discussion. Ironically, we don't have a full board, but we're still going to go ahead and make our decision. Um, the issue uh, revolves around moving young athletes up and, and potentially taking the place of a qualified older athlete, and so that's where this uh, discussion all um, yeah. began. Brandy, do you want to pull a chair up? We, we currently have to go ahead. Can I stand? You can do whatever you want. I don't yeah. stand. Correct me if I'm wrong. Awkward. We currently don't have a school policy. We nope. follow the state policy. Correct. Okay. Yep. We follow state policy, which is what this APP is. Yes. Right. Okay. So okay. if we open up the folders, there's some information that'll show you. Since it changed from what the terminology used to be back in the day when I was in school, was selective classification. Um, what you have on the right side of the folder are there's uh, documents that the first one, the first one is actually the athletic code of conduct and it talks about the philosophies and just where they are with the different levels. And then as you go through, you'll see what our numbers have been since when they changed the policy from selective classification to what is now called the advanced athletic placement process. Um, that started in 2015. So it'll show you the numbers of all the student athletes that were <coughs> recommended by a coach to be considered to go through the process. And then you have to be approved for the process to be able to get for a tryout. So for example, the first step is I reach out to the coaches and I ask them if they have anyone that is on their radar that they would like to see be go through the process. So they have to make a recommendation and it talks about their physicality as well as the social emotional opportunities that they think that that individual would be a viable candidate to go through the process. From that, then I contact the parent or guardian and I send them, um, they have to sign a form understanding what the policy is and then granting their permission for the child then to go on to the next step. The next step is that there's a maturity form. So there's a Tanner scale. 
Canter scales are different per sport and per different per level. So that form has to get completed by the physician of the individual, the family physician. That form then gets reviewed by our medical director. And we have, if you notice, some of the names are in red. Not names, numbers are in red. I didn't put any student names in there. The numbers are in red. Those are the ones that have been declined. So they actually haven't made it through the process to be then approved to try out. If they then meet the maturation of what they're supposed to for the Tanner scale, then they have to pass um, four out of the five components of the physical fitness test. And that is based on their age and then based on the level of the sport as well, so, and also the gender. So that's the rigor that has to happen before they even can get approved for the first day of what would be a tryout season. That has to be done before the first day of the tryout. So when family ID registration opens up, there's at times a lot of people that sign up, but not all of them either get approved because maybe they didn't submit a physical, maybe they signed up because some of their friends wanted to, and then they reconsidered, or maybe they, they saw their grades, or they saw different things, or something else jumped out, and they even though they signed up, they didn't show up for the first um, tryout. That's where it's difficult to slow this process down um, it doesn't guarantee that anybody that goes through the APP process that is eligible to try out makes a team and that's we clearly identify that as well and I, I inform the parent of that that it's a process um, it just grants them that opportunity to attend the first day of a tryout that's where it's difficult because you might have 52 student athletes that are registered for a sport or for a couple sports teams but not all of them might show that first day. And then we have kids that might be in holding if we were to delay the APP process to see what would transpire from or who's gonna show up or who's gonna show up the next day. Sometimes that first day is great and then they wake up the next day and they're super sore and they can't <laughs> return the following day. So that's where it's difficult with this because APP has to be done before the actual trial process occurs. So. I think when we went into this conversation about a year ago, there were some conflicting opinions even on the board, and I think some of us were a little unclear and had maybe some, some from an emotional level, had some opinions about, um, I know there, there were some, Brandon, I think was very interested in this and didn't like the fact that maybe a ninth grader was bumping an 11th grader off a team, and I think a lot of us could have, could agree with that from a from from that perspective but it wasn't until we really met with the subcommittee with Rhonda and she articulated that the APP process really what does that does is it levels the playing field for that student and once they've gone through that process then the grade level that student sits in is irrelevant and it provides them the opportunity then to try out correct doesn't mean that they're going to um, bump somebody you know, an upperclassman off a team. Right. But I think the most relevant piece, Sam, that came out of that was that we're applying, we're, we have a lot of conversation about this relative to athletics, but if you look at some of the other organizations in our district student organizations, we would never question a ninth grade flute player being the best flute player in the high school and taking the first chair in the wind ensemble. It just, it just happened. I might, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but we've never had that conversation. Right. But we do talk a lot about that life. So I think when we had that first subcommittee meeting, we all kind of left there with like, yeah, this is, this makes sense. Yeah, except for I think the problem is when you look at the state policy, it says the APP is not to be used to fill positions on teams, which we do, provide additional experience, which we do, provide an opportunity for a middle school or junior high students when no modified program is offered, which we do, or to reward a student, I'm not going there. But, uh, but, but obviously we are using the APP in ways that it was not intended to. It is intended to be aimed at a very few select students who are those rare. amazing rare athletes that just need to be challenged at another level. When you look at our numbers, I mean we have some high number of amazing students then that are athletes well and my concern <laughs> that we talked about prior 
to this coming out, well, in, through my observations through the years, that a lot of these younger ones that go up onto a varsity team end up sitting on the bench and get three minute play time. You know, and that was my frustration. Um, because if they're playing at their uh, age level, grade level, they get playing time. You know, but for whatever reason, they get moved up and then they sit. We won't move students up. I know since I've been here, we don't do it as a, as a space filler. So for example, this fall, we only had 11 student athletes on the JV boys team and we had to make cuts at the modified team because I refuse to allow kids to move up just to be a number so that we fluff soccer. up a team You're for soccer, soccer, yes, for boys soccer. So we won't do that. So the recommendations also, we talk about the social emotional level, if that student athlete is gonna be, even though they might have the physical skill base, we wanna make sure that socially emotionally they're also able to participate and be a viable member of that team. So our numbers, they look large but they're really not large compared to other schools even in our county um, phoenix and mexico and smaller schools actually have more numbers but we're really trying to keep the integrity of an exceptional athlete that we're trying to simulate their growth just as much as we're trying to have it so it's a safe environment for them to participate both physical as well as cognitive I think the argument that some board members were making, Brandon was one, like he's not here so I feel like I'm his voice a little bit, but he would articulate, and I think Heather shares this, and I think Sam did at some point, and I do, is when we follow the APP process and the ninth grader, you know, takes a spot on a, on a, a team, the social emotional impact on a 11th grader who has no other opportunity, where the student, the younger student who took that spot has an opportunity to play at a lower level. And so that, I think, was the perspective that we really wanted to hear about in Absolutely, that first yeah. committee meeting. <coughs> right. I think it's the and form, I think it's the form says it's unique to every kid. Yeah. I mean, as a parent of a kid that did that, I mean, so um, I think it's unique to the situation. And if that's what we need to look at. We gotta look at the parent not trying to push their kid up because they think they're better than they are or whatever. That's the problem. I mean, I think, I think if it's based on the right pieces that you're putting together, then it can be successful. And I think as anybody as a coach, you wanna have the best players on the field, especially at the varsity level. You wanna have a competitive team. Um, so I think it's, it's individual. I think it's gonna be based individually on everything. And it's same thing with a musician. If you got that musician that's, quote unquote, a rock star. Um, you're not going to say, oh, you stay with the middle school orchestra when you can be leading the, no, no disrespect, you could be, right. you know, leading the charge. And I think that's just, for a young person, I think that's, you know, you want to keep their expectations and let them shoot for the highest they can go and, you know, they can keep going. So I, I think it's unique to each, each kid. Um, specific enough in the criteria? I mean, it's one thing you bring up music, and it's one of the things where you can go, yeah, can you play this piece? You can play that piece. I know that, therefore, you're capable of doing that. But the, I think what we're looking at here, it's, you're right, it's individual, but what's the criteria? Is it going to be specific enough so that we eliminate those issues where people are, you know, take that right out of the picture? Can we do that? Or I mean, not? That, that would be tough because some sports, so for example, for bowling and for golf, the student athlete has to actually physically score on versus three practices or three tryout competition matches. They have to be able to score within the top eight or they can't make it. Like that's just like, that's a very, you know, objective, measurable. Right. measurable and that's a, but that's a very good, not to interrupt, right. but it's a very good example because of where I think there's maybe some inequities. Bowling and golf are both sports that if you weren't if you didn't grow up in a bowling alley or on a golf course, right. you need some coaching to find out if you have the talent. So by the system we have, you have seventh and eighth graders taking places from older kids who could grow in the sport if they had coaching. 
And this is a public school. This is not a private school. This is a public school. It is funded by everybody. So we need to make sure that opportunity is as equitable as possible. And so I think that that's one place where we may, it's just a very good example of where there's potential that's within a student that it just, it, it's untapped because they didn't get the coaching. They came in, they didn't get the high score. Now we will give the bowling folks credit in that they do allow those kids who didn't make the team to stay and they be coached, and I really appreciate that. But obviously it's not possible with golf. It's just too time frame. So. Okay, this is open. I, I admire everything everybody's saying, and all of you are passionate about somebody you must know or, or something that's happened or whatever, but I guess my, my, I'm sitting here saying to myself, my son tried out for JV basketball this year and there was 45 kids tried out for JV basketball and I didn't see anybody running to start a freshman team. So, I mean, I think if you're worried about kids or kids participating, I think we need to look at our numbers closer as our kids are, because every year is different. You know, next year there might be 10 kids try out for that JV team, but we, we kind of need to get the heartbeat of the community and, and know what's going on and then offer those those extra, I mean, other schools do what they do, throw an extra team in. If it has to be an extra JV team, I mean, it's, 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 it's fundable. It's, I think that would, I think that would, I think that would solve, I, I think that would solve what everybody at the table is trying to, trying to accomplish to get more kids involved in things to give, give them time to fill so they're not filling their time with bad things so uh, yeah so like fully prepared in life ready like I understand what you're saying Heather and I was you know disappointed with how many kids n not any of my kids in the school district but it, when we have to cut that many kids they want to start learning and modify and we don't have a second modified team to Johnny's point I mean he's using a more recent situation with JV and why didn't we have a freshman basketball team but we see these programs coming up and I have had conversations with Rhonda when you go up and, and watch the kids playing soccer half of the city's up there and like we need to have a pulse on that to see what's coming downstream so that the school district can be prepared to have to you know have available as many opportunities so you don't have those cuts. But at some point, and especially at a varsity level, you know, with, with, the, with the parents and, and the kids that have put the extra work in and everything like that, when do they get rewarded? Because when you go out into the real world and you have to be life ready, like everybody is not successful. Everybody doesn't get the same opportunity as the ones who really strive and are better than other ones. I mean, that's, that's the life ready part. And at some point, I think it's the varsity level. You, you, you have to, you have to start teaching that. You're not going to be able to have 40 kids on a golf team. And golf, to your, to your, I mean, if you don't start playing golf, you just, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you play golf, but you're not going to pick it up in a year. So if you have an epiphany as a sophomore um, that you're going to be a great golfer and score in the top eight, probably not. So, so that's why we that's why we're having this conversation because there are uniquenesses as far as offering more opportunity I don't think any of us would disagree with that if we can budget it in we would love to be able to do that and maybe Rhonda in this budget process you can take the numbers from this where we're at and say okay this sport next year we need a we need an additional JV we need additional this it, it may be a pipe dream I don't know but let's at least dream it and let's or see if we can afford it if you see you've got 45 children that are trying out and there's potential for us to add another modified team, come back to us and let's see if we can find them on there. But as far as like everybody getting a trophy kind of concept, that's not what I'm talking about. One of the, um, some of the examples that have happened are, you know, an eighth grader taking an 11th grader's position who had grown in the sport. What and if they're What's that? If the eighth grade, the eighth grade is better than the eleventh grade. They're their better. time's coming. <laughs> their time's there is coming. A place for the eighth grade. <laughs> if they're better that's that time, I'm if they're better then, but what if they're better then? Uh, I'm so saying it's a, a this is my question. feeling, that's a huge and what I'm representing is this is a public school, publicly oh, yeah. funded, equal opportunity as much as possible. Yes, so everyone's going to have their own strengths and different things, <coughs> musical, athletic, that kind of a thing. We're not going to. Um, make sure that every kid has a place on every team 
Um, but what we want to reward is hard work. Oh, yeah. So if that 11th grader has been dedicated from the time they were in seventh grade to stay on a team and work hard, you shouldn't then that, get replaced because somebody happens to be born more talented. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. Unless something went really bad. Yeah, That's I mean, what, that, probably, those and, things and I hope, is that and I hope your coaches aren't promoting that. But, but on the other end, you know, you can save an extra spot on the team. But you have that conversation with an eighth grader and you say, look, you, know, you might not have the swag. You're, you're not going to keep the swagger you have playing at that modified level. And part of sports, you need that swagger. So going up can also be a bad thing for a young kid, not even emotionally, not even socially or anything else. It's just in sports, you need to keep your swagger or else your confidence level is going to be brought down and you're not going to be as good of an athlete. But those are things that you need to leave up to your coaches. To I hope your coaches are making the right decisions on things like that. And, and, and most programs, if you look at most programs that are successful, they're reloading with seniors every year. They're reloading. They, yes, they have underclassmen that are coming up through, but every year they've got a senior class that's mm -hmm. just, just reloading. And that's yeah, where success comes go. in sports. So I just, I want to uh, support what's been said about modifieds. I call them intramurals even, however you want to brand them. But having kids in the district and seeing some of the similar things, you know, you get two modified basketball teams for the middle school, but there's 68 kids, something like that, who tried out for that team. Uh, coming from school where I graduated 100 kids, it was easier to get on teams. And I understand bigger districts have different challenges. But you mentioned the budget. One thing I think would be very interesting to see the school district look at is an assessment of all of our sports all right, across the board. And how many people are participating? How much money do we spend on things? I hear about a second JV, but instead of a second JV, that may be a good way, but putting money into more modified intramural. Now we don't have to bus. There's different aspects that we don't have to spend money on. To me, as was said about being a public institution, our focus, in my opinion, when it comes to sports, is making sure that people can participate and we get as many students who want to participate as possible. And I'm glad we have things like city leagues. You know, The basketball city league is filled of students who did not make the high school teams or the middle school teams. And they all get play, and I think it's wonderful. But it costs money. All right, that's your own transportation to take people over there. It's not part of the perks that come with school and having things after school. So I really think our district would be well off to take a total assessment of, that, of athletics and see how we can spend our money to include more students, even if it means I'm only on an intramural team. They're going to be happy to be on an intramural team, practicing, getting coached, getting better. Jim, this year we did, add, we, did, we did add middle school intramurals this year to try to provide greater opportunity for students. Now, now I've recognized that it's increased. There was only one of the modified teams last year. Um, now there's two. I think it's great. Um, but I don't think every student needs to travel. I, I think when we start getting into sports where we're always competing against other schools, you build in costs that are detracting from possibly allowing more students to interact. And maybe I guess that's the definition between intramural and um, modified. Yeah. All right. Okay, again, not knowing the system. Maybe you didn't but hear everything I, I said too. And I, well, I did say I agreed with. And you. they were both. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I supported more is not one freshman kid made the JV team. So all of our freshman athletes, basketball players, are, are playing city league. Or I hope they're still right. encouraged. But I, I guess I felt awful bad knowing that that freshman class. Yeah. And, and I think it would be wrong if there were the best, and I know some spectacular eighth grade ballers, I'd be upset if they made the JV team. All right. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. I'm just saying. No, I know, I know they didn't, but the idea where. Freshman team pretty easy. I, th I think you use students that are below their grade level when there are positions to be filled that can't be filled with at least competent, decent students. Until there's a special one, and we'll never forget Taylor Sanfrano. But what's special? Okay, one Taylor, Taylor Sanfrano was the best <laughs> hockey player in New York State at eighth grade. And if she didn't get the opportunity to play on varsity hockey as an eighth grader, she wouldn't have been here. So that's where the APP is supposed to right. come yeah. into play. Yes. Okay. Those are the, that those is are the things. That you still remember her from how many years ago? Right. Okay. She was so amazing. So 
I'm wondering if we need to kind of bring this conversation to closure. So the question is, do we need to change the policy? Do we need, like Tom said, to maybe um, alter the process a little bit to make sure that we have to kind of accommodate everything? And then I think what's come out of this conversation that is really good is in the middle of a budget process, which is what we're in the middle of now, and we are trying to be more long-term in our perspective, um, if we could get numbers from you or analysis from you as we look towards the next couple of years as to what sports, I feel terrible about the, the freshmen in limbo right now um, for basketball because, and you know I've always been a proponent for more inclusiveness when it comes to athletics. Our county deals with obesity. It's a huge health indicator problem that we have in our county. So more kids in athletics is going to help with that. So. If we could get that from you, yeah. that would be fantastic. Yeah, and then sometimes, like, you know, adding a team sounds good, and I'm glad that we have the intramurals, which is a great opportunity. Adding a team, at times, you come down with gym space, and I'm already getting complaints that mm -hmm. we practice until 9 o'clock at night. I don't have another gym to give for practice time, and that's not even counting in the community-based programs that we've built into our spaces right now. And knowing that we have a capital <coughs> project coming up where there's going to be some major hiccups with space and fields and, yeah. and stuff, we're going to end up with more issues. So we try to keep a pulse on it. This year was an, a year that, you know, we see a ton of kids coming out, and, and that's a great thing. I mean, they're good problems to have, but with the intramurals, I think we've helped out with that. And I also know that Jen Simborski has a combined 7, 8, and 9, and she's captured a lot of those kids that were not successful at making a team. So they have a home, it's just not an interscholastic home. So they the city league level. Yeah, right. they're still working the on their basketball yeah. skills and stuff. The solutions like that. aren't impossible because right. we had a much smaller high school with a much larger student population. Right. And we had freshman basketball and we had right. freshman football and we had and we also still we continue with a four season winter um, or four seasons <laughs> for uh, modified and we're looking in two to three years we've talked as a section that we want to try to make that more authentic because what that does is it allows kids to participate in sports that would be off season so they might be taking a spot when they get to be a freshman and they have to choose between soccer girls soccer and volleyball or boys soccer and boys volleyball then they might have been able to play all all to both of those because winner one and winner two is split that way but then when they have to make the choice, they then could decimate a program because a lot of kids might say, okay, so I did modified soccer, I did modified volleyball, but now when I have to choose at the JV level, which do I choose? So you're looking at some of those kids and that's why the numbers can ebb and flow like in that direction. So what we are looking at, we are looking at trying to add some modified sports within to capture some more kids of where there might not be cuts like bowling and so as a as a league we are trying to work on different things like that maybe doing indoor um, track and field where we could maybe use Romney but do some different things for kids kind of like being an intramural base to have those kids doing something that there wouldn't be cuts necessarily so we are looking at that yeah yeah, it sounds like this is a, a, a broader conversation than just the APP, but I but I do think that's a good thing to come out of it, especially as we think about budget. Yeah, yeah it could just be an athletic yeah. conversation, subcommittee, yeah. athletic right, we'll planning, see. something okay. like that. And then yeah. you're working with a smaller group of people. Yeah. Okay, so we need to make a decision here, folks, about if we want to change, create our own little policy or change process or just move forward. I think just exploring, you know, when you went back to the state rights on it, and the, instead what it's supposed to be, aimed at a few select students can benefit from such placement because of their level of readiness, that we have to be able to quantify that and make those measurables to the best of our ability. So it just takes some of that, um, the guessing out of it. So that's what I would think when you go to the smaller committee, that we look at those issues and see how we can do it the best we can. Expanding opportunity. No, not necessarily no. expanding opportunity, the criteria for it, just being more specific. Make, yes, making being, sure that we're really staying true to what the state wanted the APP to be. It should really be an exception, not a rule. Yeah. Just that the criteria becomes specific. I mean, it's right there. It's still kind of general. Yeah. But then, you know, how do we quantify that? So that when these you know, kids come in, we go, yes. Because it's so easy that, you know, if you're a coach up there and that kid's really good and you, go, you want him, you know, that doesn't really fit the regs, right. you know? Let's make sure that we're doing the kids a service and the teams a service and all the way around. But we have to quantify it. We're not saying you're not. 
No, no, no. No, no, You know what I'm saying? No, no, yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. I think it, I think this process has gotten loose everywhere. Really, I do. Yeah. It's become um so <laughs> that sounds like a pretty heavy lift to quantify that. Um <laughs> Well, no, I guess just being, if we could set the criteria, I mean, because if we sit down in that, are we answering those questions every time we look at a kid, you know, and we're making sure that we're eliminating all those other aspects. Well, so we could put, maybe we could put more poignant bullets on the actual coach's evaluation form that is the first step for this process, if they are going to recommend somebody so that they have to say, before I write this child's name down, we need this, 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 and this. And then also, like, follow back with what Linda said about are they going to be guaranteed 50% or more playing time? And just have that on that sheet so that there's no, so when they sign that sheet and submit that sheet with the child's name on it, then that's the expectation. So I know that it's in the policy, and I know that I talk policy to all the coaches at their preseason meeting. But sometimes when you're filling out a form, like you said, oh, I really want that student. But am I remembering the four poignant things that Rhonda said about what the state regs are? They might not be, because they might be you know, having their own little thought process agenda. So mm -hmm. we can totally do that. Maybe an APP review with your coaches. Yeah, yeah. Especially that form that we ask yeah. for them to submit. I, I personally think if we're really following the APP as it's designed, that these numbers should be one for winter, two for spring. You know what I mean? It really shouldn't be 12, 14, like that. That's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems like exceptional is exceptional. I just don't, I don't want to overstep what I think we should be doing. I think this is an athletic director. A lot of this should be, and rather should be and she is communicating with us when she's coming across things as, as uh, Mr. Dunsmore said over there, you know, if you have a number situation coming up with basketball or something, and I think Linda brought that up, bringing that to our attention if, if we see it coming so that we might be able to address that because, you know, there will be situations like the soccer one here this year. Um, I sat through that. I mean, I'm a varsity player, but they could have used a couple kids. I think there were some, some games where they played with 10 kids on the field. And we talk about, for those that don't know, soccer takes 11. And you have no subs, and you're playing a 90-minute game, 80-minute game. That's tough. And that's tough for any kid <coughs> to play those 80 minutes. And you're most likely going to struggle that whole season and not taking anything away from what you your decision. I think it should be your decision. But I think there's, like I said, there's going to be situations that come up. And I think we ought to be careful that we don't handcuff ourselves to when it's needed, you know, I mean, if it's football, which I see we're talking about down the road, you, you may have injuries come up and you may, not that you have to pull an acre and up to play varsity, but you gotta have options, I think, just because numbers and we struggle with numbers. And I think our basketball sounds good because I think a lot of our program's numbers are not really like the super set be back in the day, yeah. the day, they had <laughs> freshmen, South JV, varsity, you know, in the same, same facilities and such we had. And I know we're trying to fit more in our schools, but we were able to run the three teams, three practices, three whatever. So I think it's it's going to be unique from different teams. And I know that's what I'm saying. I don't know how much we as a board get involved in that piece. Well, I think the reason this came up is because we do have control over policy. Right. So, and again, the issue was young yeah. kids taking right. older kids to No, my, my point is I just think I would, my goal would at least be to trust the athletic director to come to us with and I know maybe it's just a big, it's not, it's not easy. It's not gonna be easy. No, 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 it's being subjective each time. Well, I think you're, you leave it to coaches, correct? Uh, they make a recommendation. No, and I get the process. Yeah, not all recommendations. You, you step back. At that point in time, you have nothing to say. It's the coach's decision. Once they're trying out, the team. they yeah. go through a rubric, and yes, yeah, so there's a rubric for the tryout. So. I guess what I'm saying is maybe that's part of the athletic director's job. But they have out. to get past that part of it. So I think what Brian's so. suggesting is maybe maybe one of the ways we can be a little bit more deliberate is to have you stay involved with these very this handful of exceptional athletes um, through the tryout process, so that you're you're also seeing that they are exceptional and yeah. And I mean, I've done that, but I've not made their decision for them. Like usually the first week when we have these kinds of situations, I'm in practices 
making sure because there's always the questions of why can't I try out today because their physical's not uploaded or something like that. So I'm always on hand the first few practices anyways just to make sure things are going well. Also on checking the coaches and making sure they have a plan in place and then they have a rubric for the tryout versus well I think this 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 and this one so I am there I just they all happen at the same time so I try to spend at least 10 to 15 minutes in each one because I, I can't be there for the whole practice and then meet the next one because there's some that are going on at the same time so I am in part I am in the practices I don't just let it go and not attend practices at that point especially during tryouts Okay, so let's just, I, I mean, I feel a little uncomfortable about just leave, leaving it where it is, but um, because I do think this is a problem that existed seven years ago when I was on the board. Um, but I will defer to the majority. My suggestion is that I don't want to say put it off, but I'd say put it off until we have the other two. Because I think they're both vocal when it comes to athletics. Well, they were on the subcommittee, though. Oh, okay. Clear. So, okay. and you know, and, and they both, both of them agreed that there was enough very variables sport to sport that it would be tough to make a policy right. that, I, I, that, I, that overarches yeah. everything. So, I mean, maybe what I'm saying is we just need maybe more sensitivity, I guess, to very to strong feelings about that. Maybe well, put something here. in place where you do have that younger athlete in the tryout, where maybe you have a committee that that looks at it a little bit closer, just to make sure you're not missing. You know, you're not you're not driving a, a talented eleventh grader out to, or you're not or you're not putting the eighth grader in the bad situation. I mean, which I'm sure they're doing it now. But if you want to, as a board, want to be extra cautious, well, there's a good reason to be extra cautious when. Something like that could happen. I mean, uh, some coaches might miss it. Some may be might miss it. And, and the, the ultimate goal is not to miss it. So, so I wonder. I wonder how much it comes up to because I, I see the numbers, but what I say with basketball, that's kind of a that's a tough one because it's five players on the court. But a lot of these other teams, there's more. And we struggled with numbers, and if that unique situation comes up where you have that eighth grader coming up and you have that 11th grader you don't want to cut, then don't cut. I mean, if, you, if you're going to carry 15, carry 16 then or something. Or something they still get to practice. They That's still fine. get the experience. And normally, I, and, I, and I would challenge this, I don't think we have a lot of numbers where there's major cuts happening. <coughs> the start, I mean, it's good if we do. I mean, meaning not good that we're cutting them, but meaning we have a lot of interest. But like I said, soccer this year, they had 11 players on JV varsity had maybe 17 and five or six of them were hurt, hurt half the season. You know, so you were you were struggling. And girls was the same thing, you know. And and uh, I mean, I don't know all our other sports numbers. I know hockey's got numbers and such, but there's a lot of sports that I think you carry that extra kid in a situation that might be unique. I mean, you're right. If we're putting 11, 12 up, well, that's crazy. But yeah, two, three, four, you should be able to absorb that where they're still practicing. And because um, you know, being a part of a team is that the practice, and it's not just the game. No, I think what brought this on our radar, <coughs> and it was Brandon that brought it to us, was uh, there was a year ago there was a situation where uh, eighth graders were brought up to the JV team, and there was a, uh, a couple of kids that were, were sophomores, I think, mm -hmm. that had been playing for two years and were knocked off the team. So I think the issue is, like you just said, Brian, I think we need to retain, if those kids had put in two years, and they've been faithful to the team. Bring the, bring the better ball player up, but keep those kids on the team and at least let them practice with the team and wear the uniform. We need to reward hard work. Right. You know, exactly. I, not, I don't have any kids in, in school, um, but I saw so Emily as my own reference from when I was on the basketball team. I know it's hard for you to believe. <laughs> I was. <laughs> please, 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 please. I was. <laughs> <right there. laughs> let me. I wasn't saying. Yeah. I was just not saying that. <laughs> no, I was really there. That's your brother. Um, no, but I, I just remember when we came up and the coach would have a talk to you at a certain point when we were JV and I played JV basketball. And uh, there were certain people and I'd be like, look, you're not going to get the playing time. You have the choice. You can stay on if you, if you want, or you can go to City League and you're going to get more experience to build your skills to come back later. All right? And then everybody, you had that option. But it was. Um, 
I mean, it was just very honest, very open, and you have the skills. You, you, you're not going to get playing time. You can come and, and practice and be there. But I mean, that was the way it worked. Um, Which is fine. Yeah. Because then you're still embracing those kids who are willing to put the hard work right. in. Right. I think it speaks to what Sam was saying, too, about those kids that to travel along. So we got these other kids, and they need to be, if they're brought up, they need to be exceptional, going back to our rule. And the only reason we're bringing them up is to give them the experience because they have the skill set that deserves to be there and say to those other kids, yes, we're going to keep you guys on. You have the time and you'll be able to practice. You may not get playing time. The crazy thing about that is, unfortunately, the, well, like, well, we I think I remember way back when we accepted that and we just wanted to practice and be on the team. But now, guess who gets involved when you don't get the play time? Parents. Yeah, parents. Yeah. And that is a disaster. Well, is that? I mean, that's terrible, you know, because you're taking away from the kid who could be with a better coach on a team practicing to get better. It's not about play time, but it always comes down to playing time. It stinks. Okay. <clears throat> My parents didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> he was occupied. Go ahead. <laughs> Linda, your feelings? You know, I just think that you've got a terrific um, AD, and she's listening to this discussion and some of the concerns that we've been bouncing around, and um, I think we let her run with it, meet with her coaches discuss what you're hearing, what the concerns are, and let's see how the year goes. Are you comfortable with that? Totally. Thank you. Can everybody can I just interject? I really do like the idea of that form that you were talking about, like maybe really outlining, because I agree with you, Heather, it probably shouldn't be this many exceptional yes. things, right. but it might not just be one, and then the coach really does need to have that conversation with Rhonda to make sure that who they're bringing up is the exceptional yeah, and some of the students are the same students per season do you know yes. what i mean so it's not like it's they're all like just a singleton right we do they're have up here we do here have several two and three, three sport yeah. athletes that rise really great, sure. right really right so and you got it you got it sure. okay good thank you all all right um, yeah, we'll just, you guys, we're going to switch it so that people who aren't interested in the community relations discussion can leave. So we'll do football, we'll do football. next. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll let Rhonda jump in, but clearly everyone understands that we had quite a situation last fall mm -hmm. and we made a decision, the board made a decision for the health and safety of students that we had to suspend our season because of. Um, not enough viable kids to play football. And those that were on the roster, some of them just didn't, weren't as committed as we needed. And rather than forfeit teams or have injuries, we decided to suspend that season. However, we didn't suspend football in Oswego forever. We've had a very successful modified program. Um, and I, it, we're at a juncture now where we're, we're budgeting and planning, really planning, and we've spent quite a bit of time talk about football over the last month. And I needed the board's feelings on football moving forward. I have an, I have a, an opinion about it. Rhonda and I have met many times about it. We've met with last year's coaches and, um, and we have a plan we'd like to move forward with, but I just wanted to hear other people's feelings on it. Do we want to hear your plan? I was going to say, let's, let's get sure plan first, yeah. well, and then we can I just that. want to know how many kids <laughs> are interested. We have about we have we have about ten kids. Last year, as you know, we moved to a seven, eight, ninth grade modified program, which was very successful. And the word on the street from the co coaches of the modified program are that the vast majority of those ten, I think it's ten, twelve, 12, 12, 12. returning ninth graders who were coming back into this sort of high school who have now played modified for two or three years are very committed to football. And I think we need to give football another chance. And I think that if with the, the right recruitment, the right coaching, the right articulation between modified and, and varsity, that we need to exhaust every opportunity to field safe and competitive teams. And um, 
I guess I'll leave it at there and maybe let Rhonda jump in and we can. So rather, I, I don't want to talk about too, too many specific things about what our plan might be because we have to go certainly through the process, um, posting for coaches, the selection of, and uh, appointment of coaches, and then the recruitment and development of a team roster. But Rhonda? So the first sheet, you can see the football season numbers from 2016, which would be the fall of 2016, through the fall of 2019. In 2016, we did not have a varsity program. We had a JV program, which included 9th through 12th graders. There were 33 student athletes that were on the roster. For modified that year, which was 7th and 8th graders, there was 29. And then you can see the numbers as they go back um, as we are to where we are current for this fall. Um, 2017 is when we visited back to go to varsity. Um, and then this year was our first year, like Dr. Gui said, that we had um, a varsity team that was consisted of 10, 10th graders through 12th graders. And we had a modified team, which was seven, eight, and nine, which seemed to be very successful at that <coughs> level. Um, if you look, we do have we have six seniors from this year that are graduating, so that will leave us with 17 student athletes that would have been on this fall's roster that would potentially come out and try out for this coming year, which would be the fall of 2020. And then with 12 that were ninth graders last year on modified, which will be sophomores this upcoming fall, you know that's the number that we're looking at, and that's just of what was currently in the program, exists in the program. So that doesn't mean that we won't have more kids that are interested in playing, so. Well, here's a point in case too. You've got 40 students, um, athletes at seven through ninth. So if you've got exceptionally skilled students there, there no, could be a recommendation no, to move nope. them. <laughs> yeah. You can't do that at all. Wow. Yeah. We wouldn't look at her. Guys, <laughs> yeah. That's why we moved eighth grade to the on the field with a senior. Huh? Eighth grader on the field with a senior. No, I'm saying well the ninth graders. We right. moved the ninth graders to modify to enhance our our modified oh, so program in the hopes that we well, could build our program. Tenth graders it's next seventeen year. and then they can oh, okay. there might be a few ninth graders that could handle yeah. If 17 of the, the students that played on varsity this past year, mm -hmm. uh, you, had, you, had, you had 23, graduated six, so you had 17, you got 12 committed freshmen from them, that's 29. So you look at 29. That's a pretty good number. It's a pretty if, good number. I yeah. believe there are more students yeah. that could be well, improved. Yeah, that's all I that that But right. you no, said that was 23 so. on the roster, not, not committed to, because I thought the reason we canceled is because not all 23 were committed. Correct. There was 23 so students on the roster. I'm not Some sure we can use 20, the 23 as a number. Years. Every given day, what, what happened with us is every day we would have the most that we had at a practice, and varsity started in August all the way until we made the decision, which was in September. There was the maximum that we had was 18. Some, some insider information. There are quite a few kids that would play football if the program had a serious Outlook, okay. recruitment, and coaching. Okay. What's what's going to be clear about these numbers? What's, what's quite a few job? What number? Oh, I'm all at least 20, 20 students that are verbally yeah. committed that would. I no, mean, no, that no, I think would kids be. talking to each other. Yes. So you think twenty then plus the twelve? Plus the ones that plus the twelve. These are new kids that never played the play. You know, are the the same forty five that tried out for basketball or. Or some other kids that play other sports that you know don't play fall sport right now that are are energized to to help to, to build a program. Did we when we had junior varsity alone in sixteen, correct? Yeah, in twenty sixteen, yeah. could we do that again as we build the program and go to that and then go to varsity the following year and take that cohort and develop them as they move up? Or well, the thirty three athletes that played JV in two thousand sixteen were not in the twelve hundred league. Correct. Aren't we gonna, then we won't, we won't get the juniors and seniors either, right? Correct. I guess my suggestion on that, Tommy, would be put, advertise for a coach as soon as possible, put that coach in place as soon as possible so that coach can build his own team first and foremost and, and also build a, a team of student athletes at the same time and, and hopefully if you hurry up and do that, I don't know when the cutoff is as far as what league 
this team has put into developmental or or a you know class A or whatever the coach feels you know the kids can compete against. But, but they need a good you know I would think a coach would need a good month's time frame to to put up some posters and to, to get in the cafeteria and to get into classrooms and, and get into coaches' heads that are already there to get to communicate with kids to to get a list of students and get them into a weight room and get them you know. Why don't you get ahead of this too? Because there's a lot of ca there's a lot. tomorrow at the county chiefs meeting, football is not on the agenda, because there are other districts that either are thinking they'll follow suit with what we they may need to follow suit with what we were faced with last year, or they're interested in talking about other alternatives. Some districts are looking at merging, some are looking at moving into developmental. Um, some I heard it's interesting. So they wanted to form just an Oswego County Football League. Or an Oswego County Football League. We're open to all yeah. those things. We're not asking. We're not ready to make those determinations yet. But I just I needed the temperature of the board to 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 know if you're comfortable with Rhonda and I moving forward in trying to create a safe and viable high school football program. I am absolutely. I think we have to give it a good try. <coughs> Let's tell our students talk. <laughs> a lot of students were upset about um, the loss of the football game, mm -hmm. especially uh, the seniors who have been out <coughs> for so long. Yes. And I definitely think that something should be done to bring it back because a lot of kids are interested in doing it. A lot of adults were upset about it too, mm -hmm. <laughs> including us. <laughs> it was one of the hardest meetings we ever really had, mm -hmm. was to make a decision that was going to be so impactful to so many kids. and to make decisions that are sometimes the right things to do or talk, but it was never a closing a door on football and a swing forever. We want to exhaust every opportunity. I know Sean, you wanted to say yeah. something, but I think the work that the Buckboosters are trying to do in, in order to build school spirit and a lot, a lot of other things, it used to be the football was the nucleus of that. And I think that, I think it's missing. Yeah. We don't have that. It's not really, I mean, a really big sport, you know. It's not as big of a deal. And it has changed across the country. Mm -hmm. Football is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the interest there. This is not an Oswego County problem, no. but well, I think the whole we section had a meeting two two weeks ago because all schools in our section are are in kind of dire straits right now. So even the Class A, Double A schools, which are your FMs and stuff, they've lost a modified team where they typically had strong contingencies of two teams. So as a section, we met to try to see what kind of thought processes we could put into place to try to rebuild numbers. So we're still working as a section to try to figure that out. Um, and we don't have to make the decision. We have to petition to be in the developmental league by 1st of February, right around the 3rd of February. Um, but the section is being a little bit more lenient because there are so many struggling schools with the sport of football. So they're trying to, you know, not adhere to, they're trying to help everybody out basically. We want to get started to sooner than we typically do and we want the board to understand that we may do some creative things. Skinny Atlas went to the same program you guys were talking, seven, eight, nine, modified, and yeah. just a varsity team. JD's struggling too. It's, it's worked out. Gene, is there some, some thought uh, about bringing back the Swoop County? Yes, we are talk about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that. Yep. Back when I played, we used to have to travel by stagecoach, but that... Remember that time that you was, got caught in the <laughs> No, I, I think the county... <laughs> thing, <laughs> No. <laughs> and then if you want Maybe it, something happen for you, so yeah. <laughs> just provided a financial breakdown of what it is for the sport spoiler, of football. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, but I wanted to show you what it looks like for the varsity team is on the front side of it and then the modified team. And then because of the state of affairs that football has been in for the past few years, this year in 2020, 30 of the helmets that we have out of the 45 are being retired out because they're not going to pass reconditioning. So we're looking at having to have a substantial budget influx to be able to safely have our student athletes participate in the sport of football. Yeah. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't, I remember the first uh, meet the candidates uh, interview and I said verbally I would, I would eliminate football. And my concern was safety. My concern was CTE because yeah. it's on every level and it's there. And so it does give me pause. I understand 
what it was for me and what it was what it is for a community and what it is for the um, for the school but I also know that idea of safety and the concern is foremost in my mind as well and that that would have to be at the forefront of everything we do that we have to get the equipment that's going to be the best you know for them and that, and that all the new practices you know in terms of uh, safe the safest way to play has, has to be instituted you know yeah. because my concern is you know what we're seeing you know I'm, I'm not are we trying to do something that the community is really not asking for you know because we see it a certain way I want to give it a try and if those kids are out there John I, and they want to do it I want to give them that opportunity to but I want to make sure we do it as safely as possible yeah, I, I echo that too Tommy but I think for one, the equipment is much better than what we played. But My two, leather helmet is but, but, no, the leather helmet doesn't work anymore. Anyway. But, but two, no, it's the, the skills that you teach the kids on how to hit. Yeah. And, and how much you hit. I mean, we used to, and even in college, there was one coach that gave us a couple of days off, and it was like a steak dinner. You know, if you have steak dinners every night, it's not that, that good. But if you hit every day, you hit every day, it kind of wears, you know, gets old too. Whereas if you don't hit as much, you get into game time, now you're hungry for it. So, I mean, you, you need to time your schedule of when you're gonna hit, and then you teach, on those days, you teach how to hit. Right, I mean, that's Where the, you're not leading with your head. Yeah, and that was the biggest concern for me this year. And, and, when and we were putting those, those statistics, so other discussions is girls' soccer is the number one for concussions. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and I don't know if our district keeps any of those records or not, but yeah. from some of the teams that I've, I've witnessed in our program, I don't know if we've had too many concussions in football. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, I think our stats would probably be right up there. With oh, just the top, when, when it, it goes back a few minutes ago, but like the superintendent was saying, and this is going to be an event. I mean, bringing this back and something that John said and then questioning how many kids are out there. If this is sold and, and solicit, you know, if, if this is put out there the right way, I think you may find five, eight, or ten kids. Again, if we just say, hey, we're bringing back football, uh, you know, I mean, there's going to be kids that are excited. But if this is an event and it's there's excitement behind it and, and there's the new coach and everything, and I was thinking, and I know we can't do this, but there's spring football for colleges and this is the big deal, like spring, they have their spring football game. I know you have to make commitments before then. But even if there's something kind of like that, with a Swigo football coming back and you get, I mean, there might be a roar. There might be, and, and there's the, the, you know, the demographics for football and it, there might be, you might end up with eight or 10 more kids that we don't, we don't even know about. If it, because it's exciting, and we've we use solid to them, and they're excited about it. So, yeah. I like the approach about there's selling it and being yeah. doing things outside of the. And there's a need to enhance the equipment and um, some of the things around our modified program too. Yeah. Uniforms in particular. Yeah. If we're going to have an exciting program that kids want to play in, and they're going to commit to from seven through twelve, and they're Oswego kids, they ought to look good and be safe. Also, yes, I, we can't do the equipment stuff and everything like that, but I would say, because we hear how community members and businesses want football, we can help. <laughs> like, you guys may not be able to do everything financially, and if it's a push sled or what, you know what I'm saying. Sure. I mean, yeah. we, we can only do so much within the school district, mm -hmm. but the community wants it. How can the boosters help? Appreciate that. Thanks, Rhonda. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Rhonda. Okay, so officially, though, you're, I think you have our, all of our nods yeah. that let's move so forward. We're going to move forward, forward, forward okay. with the personnel office to yes. get things going. Okay. okay, last but definitely not least, Tom is going to lead a discussion. <laughs> 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 Great. So, just a little, I can guess I can give a little background. Um, this committee existed um, in a couple years prior and um, consisted of members of the community business folks and um, they would meet and uh, monthly I think and kind of just get external um, input on things going on with the school district um, I Kathleen's not here but I did say I would represent her thoughts she does not feel that the this kind of a committee is um, relevant or necessary because she feels that's what we're elected to do is to be the connection with the from the community to the school district so I'll, I'll put that out there as her thoughts right away 
as I'm stalling for time for Tom. <laughs> I, can, I, I can jump in on that. Okay. Um, so I was on the board when this came about too, and I think it was very beneficial to have this board during the capital project because I think there was only so much we could do, and it was very beneficial to have um, people who might not work for the district district directly or be on the board also out there in the community voicing their support for the school district and what we're doing in extending our arms. So I personally think it's something that is beneficial. But when you say that, that the specific purpose for it in your in, was to promote capital project. At the time, yes. At the yeah, time. So last year, yes. So it was the only year we had it. It is the only reason. I went to those meetings. So that's 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 it was what the what only I went too, and that's yeah. actually why I stopped. Here. You were on the committee, right? all. I wasn't yeah. asked to be on the committee. I just showed up because I asked when they met. Right. So did I. But like the local, <laughs> but like one of the members is a local union person, and all they talked about was all the bids they were going to be able to get when the capital project passed. Mm -hmm. I do think personally there are some good things that come from. You do have some business leaders that could be involved in whatever it be, fundraising or whatever. Pam Caracoli, who has an inroads to the college, was on that committee, and I think there's a lot of synergism that can be done between many different aspects of the college and the district. So I think some things could come of that committee if the committee and the people participate, but I know a bunch of people on that committee who were on it, and they just chose to stop showing up because the capital project was done. And I also think that we have to understand our place as a board and, and you know, any, any subcommittee we create has to also fit within our jurisdiction. And so as you're talking about, you know, connections with the college and whatever, really the, yeah. the appropriate place for that to start is, I think, with administration, right. Right. not the board. So, but let me give it to you now. Um, <laughs> it to me, yeah. um, well, I think you're right. It, it, uh, the genesis was out of the capital project and was to reach out and, and to members of the community, and it served that purpose. Uh, but there were also some good things that did come out of it. That as after the project had uh, uh, gone, had passed, and one was looking at a career counselor via Pam Caracoli and the Shinneman Foundation, a career counselor that would be able to guide people from seventh and seventh through twelfth, because our current counselors are so overwhelmed um, that they aren't sometimes able to address the real career, career concerns of the students. So that was one of the things that came out of it. The other thing was with Pat Carroll, who was the, the union uh, appropriate there, but what it helped is to uh, revisit the apprentice program and then uh, subsequently meet and deal with the apprentice program in the capital project and with the uh, um, our GC that we ended up going with to make, make sure that that program works. My, uh, and, and I will just say personally, it, it, it kind of, I ran into personal issues around the time of the next meeting that was scheduled and, and that's where everything kind of dropped. And also the consideration with the board was, um, are we going to continue it because it was an ad hoc committee? Are we going, or, or what are we going to do with it? Has it become a problem solving committee, you know, uh, or something different than that? So when I come back here, I want to know, do we want it and what's its purpose? And we need to be specific about that. Um, if it is to open as a conduit to, uh, to the community, uh, a, a, a way for people to access the board prior to uh, coming here, and then we translate and, and communicate that to the board, that's part of it. But the options here. I looked at some other places and, and what their community relations committee <laughs> were coming up with was we're having um, the bands play at uh, the uh, at meetings or uh, choruses because they're trying to get uh, community interaction and participation. Everyone's trying to do that because the only time people come out are basically when it's <coughs> tax related or it's something controversial. Right? So uh, my guess is to put it to the board if we're going to have it, will it continue to be an ad hoc committee or a standing committee? And if so, what is the purpose of it? And what well, will we do? And you know, I've got to interject here because I heard yes. a lot of things. I wasn't on the board last year. And I did hear a lot of, of uh, information that at times that committee uh, was a place to vent frustration. Um, and 
if there was going to be a committee like that, my focus would be that they have an agenda, such as we're working on putting up the budget. That's what our focus is right now. Or, you know, not a place to go and to bring opinions and problems and from the community, because they can come here and do that. Exactly, that's right. Um, but I, I think you would have to have a facilitator that could handle that and could also, uh, with the board, say, okay, these are the issues that are coming forward to us and we would like some ideas or we would like you to go out and advocate uh, to the community for the budget or football or you know but to get a group of people together and not have a focus and an agenda is murky water yeah. oh exactly and that's what happened once we had a, once we had a um, something specific which was the capital project that drove us it was our objective once that was off the table then it was like okay what is our objective what's our mission statement what well, are we here for? couldn't that come from the board well, it should have. Yeah, and you that's, know, like say I'm on it, I would say to the board at a meeting, and you know, when it's time for board members to to talk about what we had accomplished at that committee meeting, um, where we were at with whatever uh, agenda you had given us, and when that was accomplished, I'd say to the board, "Is there a burning uh, thing that you would like us to be working on next?" so that it doesn't become a vehicle for negativity. opinions and negativity and that sort of stuff to fester. Oh, I, I agree. I agree, I, I agree 100 percent. That's why I think it's up to us to consider, again, mm -hmm. do we want it and what's the specific use. And in some respects, Linda, that sounds like public relations <coughs> more than community relations, which right, are they the same thing, are they interchangeable? But if that's our purpose, is it just being uh, more proactive on the public relations of the board? Is that, or, or just within the community and sending up, communicating our message, you know? Well, not really, because if we're, uh, if you're going out and saying, okay, we're, thinking, you know, we're in the process of looking how to implement football back in uh, to the district. Um, these are the things where we're at in the process. These are the things we're looking at right now. One of the issues may be uh, equipment. Uh, maybe we could get people to go out into the community and give those points out. And like you said, they may say, well, let's work on um, maybe grants for equipment, maybe, uh, you know, businesses, offering assistance for getting our equipment but it's got to be a focus Agreed. that's my concern mm -hmm. so maybe the membership of the committee community membership of the committee other than the standing board members who serve on that committee would change based on whatever the I would like that. Whatever, Whatever the, agenda the agenda or target is, right. is at that time, right. Right. we recruit those that think would be most helpful in that particular endeavor. Right. So it would be project based. Which yeah, I have yeah. 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 to say. Right. 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 That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. That's that's project. Specific I think that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Like project yeah. based. Yeah. Got it. I mean, it's sort of a nightmare in a, in a way because you aren't really going to be having you know, this reg regularity. You know what I right. mean? That's but we're happy time wants to oversee it. It's his committee. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't realize that was part of this? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all <laughs> <I'm> on paper. <laughs> um, but what I like about that really is, you know, yeah. the different folks in the community have different gifts and different um, yes. things to bring right. to the table. And I do think that recruitment was an issue last time because I think it was Agreed. more like hand picking as opposed to, um, you know getting a broad base of people mm -hmm. and representation. And, and an example too of that is, is in all fairness, during the capital project, Dean made himself available at like all the Christmas concerts and everything. And we tried to help him where we could. But where we couldn't be there, say somebody like Jim, mm -hmm. you know, but somebody like Jim 
Oh, I was there. I know, you were there. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> but anyway, so it's But it gave opportunities for somebody else in the public who had that same passion that mm -hmm. we did to be there as well. About it, so yeah. then if Dean's like, okay, I gotta run from here to there, I got it. I got to cover that. And it may not have been one of us seven. Right. It may have been somebody else in the community who was carrying the same. Um, yeah, so, like, it. Sam was out at the Laker games, correct? And you usually yeah. had somebody with you, maybe that wasn't a board person sometimes. It was Jim Huckley. Jim Huckley. Yeah. 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 Right. So, I mean, so when there's cases where people have that vested interest and they're kind of extending, like, what we're doing. But I agree, there's going to be certain things where they might be talking about something that they might have. You don't want my opinion. I know nothing about that. So from the community, great. You're not right. a piece of that. You know, I see it being a positive that we could, uh, through the community, maybe get a, a better feel of the pulse of the community. Like, talk about the issue with the with the infill. Uh, if that was looking ahead. Yeah. yeah. Kind of actually, in the essence, what we're doing right now. If that were the community relations committee, right. we'd sit and have this discussion with everybody right. about these topics. Right. Do you know so what I, mean? I, I do. Just however, a, just a sense. Yeah, but then you go back again to representation on the committee and making sure that you are getting a broad perspective and not a narrow perspective. So what you're talking about, what you just said, is more a committee that stays static, that is the same committee, as opposed to what Linda was suggesting, which is depending on the project, it puts together the team. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, think we the, need to decide. There are three members on the standing committee of board members and the superintendent. Collectively, based on whatever the project yeah. or target was, we would identify community members that we think would be most helpful to engage with us to do that task and reach out to them. I think it's important too, because I don't want, the, much like uh, for the capital project, I don't want it to be perceived as it's only moving in one direction. We want opinions, we want to bring that back, we want that information from across the spectrum. You know, and so it's their opinions and their their engagement is is vital, you know, to it as well. Do you know what I mean? I don't want it to seem like it's just our our information moving out, but it's the engagement with the community that's drawing it and facilitating the conversation. Like I hear you, but I think that's exactly what Kathleen's position is. That's what we are opposed to, and she she thinks that that's your job. And this venue, the sign up community members can come and address the board. That is their opportunity to, uh, like Jim does all the time. I'm strange. <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you. So, talk about something like this. If you would have had this group, and that group would have called in environmental groups, whether it be governmental, non governmental, whatever, I went to some. If you would have gone to the Buck Boosters, I went to them. If you would have gone to groups that you think had interest, even opposed, I was scared to go to the Buck Boosters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, told, I thought I was gonna go into a hostile environment where nobody was gonna wanna hear it. Everybody was like, wow, I didn't know. One person was like, hey, I've got, I've got a student athlete that plays indoor soccer. I didn't realize all that stuff coming up, all the chemicals that come up that can cause respiratory problems, especially in indoor facilities. But people were unaware. And so I think part of it is, as Tom, you were saying, it is putting things out, but it's bringing them back in. But if it doesn't go two ways regularly, then it's not a dialogue, right? right? It's a diatribe sometimes, yeah. not a dialogue. And so you really need to be able to bring in those disparate groups and get all of those opinions. Because there's a lot of people out there in the, in the community who don't have the luxury that I do, all right? They don't have the children of an age where I can leave them home a little bit another family where I don't have to work at night. You know, there are things that I can do to be able to do this, and there's a lot of people that I know and talk to who would love to come down here and participate at times, just don't feel they have the time or energy. So, if that's the direction we're gonna go, is more the traditional sense of a committee, then with a, you know, with, with a dialogue, as you suggested, my only thing is it has to be a broad spectrum of people. Mm -hmm. we, we can't just have a narrow spectrum of people and expect that that is going to be getting a tap on our community. So are you saying we're not going to do it, focus on like what our need is as a board and a district? I, I still think we need to go in that direction so that there's an agenda so that we're to talk about. There's an agenda, about. right. And, and, and it would be like a think tank. I mean, we're going out and saying, you know, this is where we're at. These are some of the issues we're facing. 
and you call the people in that have expertise or financial resources or know the community in respect to uh, young players and or whatever the issue is. And then they help you find solutions, find answers. If it's going out and selling something to the community, they come up, help us come up with a plan to do that. So just to be clear, what you're advocating for is, is, is a committee that changes with, changes with the projects. Right. I don't think that's where Tom was headed. No, I, I'm okay with that. The thing I kind of refer to what Jim was saying too, what, no, what's important to me is that whoever we're engaging with, that the community it is a dialogue and that we want them yeah. engaged and we're, as opposed to, I think some people felt used or feel used. We're only here when you need us to get a message out. Mm -hmm. so that's not what it should be. You know, it's like they, you're here because you bring something to the table that's yeah. special and, and it does. And you know, we stumbled along to those two other issues after the project was cleared, um, but it gave us some, it gave us some focus. <coughs> yeah, like, okay, here's, here's a point, we can move on this as far as the school counselor went. Um, but you know, so the only difference being we have a specific uh, agenda and we're moving on, but we're engaging and solving that from both yeah. sides. We could do something similar to what we do for our uh, for finance committee. We have a community representative that sits on our finance committee. You might want to have a combination of one or two community members that are regular members of this committee and then also reach out to, act to others who are relevant to the topic at the time. Maybe a combination of both. So, mm -hmm. so the problem with that is the one or two people could run for the board. Do you see what right. I'm saying? Yeah, so understand. we do not want to replicate what we already do here. Right. However, right. if we're going to do project based, then obviously there are folks who have, yeah. you know, specialities in yeah. specific areas. Um, but I, it's, it means every time we change our project, you're out recruiting again. <laughs> yeah, and that's why. I don't and then that's we, kind of we, no, he doesn't have to we, we sit and talk as a board and have ideas of people that we could ask to sit on this specific committee because this is our agenda we know you have expertise in this area and board it may for the committee. and it would board be three boards for the committee mm -hmm. yeah. so and listen to this i to me, it sounds, having served on many different boards and committees myself, um, and very different types of them as well, uh, having a consistency is good, having a leadership and just the ability to move things forward, having a bunch of different people come in and out, I think is a mechanism for confusion. Yep. If, you had single, if you had three board members that were committed to this, and then as we talked about, bring in others, to me, this football discussion is a prime example of what this committee could do. Because I heard that there are a lot of students who are interested in this. Right. And you're going to be making budgetary decisions based on this. One of the things this committee could do is invite people in and get a gauge. Are there 30, 40 kids who are interested? Or are those numbers different? You know, what does the community think about that? And have that as a forum to then bring that information to this group. Because this group, I don't know you well enough as how it works, but may not be suited for gathering information from various, on all different projects. I mean, that's the reason you have committees, is you farm out work, right? And part of the work could be, go figure out how much is the community really pushing for football before you buy 30 new helmets or whatever it may be. Make sure that th that interest is there. That committee could serve this kind of purpose. <laughs> yes. Ryan, what are you thinking? I, no, I, I, I don't even bring it up, but I'll bring it up. So, I think a great example um, was the parade this year. That was put together by the community, and it was a huge turnout. We were there. It was a big turnout, and a lot of people had different hands in it that didn't rely necessarily on the district to have to do, and that meant, you know, floats and and things going about it. And the goal was to have like. You know, ten floats or whatever, and as the parade went by, and literally twenty minutes later, when it ended, you know, because it was long, it was, but there was community people that decided that was something they were interested in, so they jumped on board. Um, and I do agree with Jim. You know, whether it's football or back myself up here, um, if we all of a sudden say, "Hey, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow about the turf," 
you can get a group of people that come out and say, hey, this is something I want to talk about. It all depends on what you want to open it to, really. Because we are seven making a decision. Mm -hmm. What do we want to open ourselves to? So that's the right. double edge of it. And if then we work as a filter to that, then bring it back to the board. That would no, there's no leave. <laughs> yeah, so. Are you willing to, to chair this? Huh? Oh, dear. Um, you want to think about it? Yes, may I? Let's think about it. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 no, why don't you think about it? Because I do think we are all looking for the You have the history on the board, on the, the civic committee. Um, is there anyone else before I'm really, who would be interested in chairing this committee? If we have the committee, I don't think we've even decided we're going to have the committee. Right. Is that something we need to be bring before Should we the carry board? over to, in two weeks? We yeah. have discussion again. <coughs> well, I mean, just I hate, I hate to have discussions over and over and over again because it makes what we've just done here meaningless. Right. So um, I will recommend that those two watch the video, and if they have more input at the next meeting, they can do that. Yeah, okay. We'll so we will have it as an agenda item, but um, I do think we need to. Nail it down. Yeah. Very brief conversation. So, so right now, where do you stand, Linda? Project oriented. Right. Focus. Changing committee with three board and members on it. Three board members on it, and even the board members could change depending on if what it's facility. Is. You know, somebody with expertise in the facility might be on the board on it that time. Uh, it's project oriented, yes. Yeah. We would need to change. Yeah. Sam, what do you think? And then you, you like that uh, I, idea? I think it's a good idea. I and think. I, yeah. And it doesn't need to be every month. That we no. could just do it based right. on yeah. what our needs there are. There just needs to be some parameters of, uh, yeah. they would have to be board approved. Yeah. The yeah. members would, I would assume. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like we did the last time. But. Yeah. So, in a sense, it, it would be an ad hoc committee that we yeah. would utilize on a big, uh, project basis yes. as needed. Um, I do like the idea of that, of being specific, because then when we ask members of the community, we're giving them time. We're not saying it's open-ended, you're gonna be here for a year or two years, whatever. Right. It's, we can go, okay, this yeah, is, this is the time. Yeah. yeah, make the commitment, we can be very specific about it. Yes. I like that too, I like that a lot. And Brian, it sounds like you like that. However, I do, but I do um, think we need to yeah, also, yeah. when we say board members, <laughs> We have to strongly keep in mind people like my friend Room over here who is very educated on a lot of pieces and I'm going to advocate for her that, you know, I've known her for a long time and people like her should have that opportunity as well because she's sitting through these meetings and such. So, in my opinion, you know, she's considered a board member that she wanted to be on. So well, absolutely. And, and if for instance you do a project and you're not interested, perhaps you have, you know, a bunch of student. You are our student connection right. who might want to sit on the committee. So I do think Brian's right, we have to have student representation, right. 100%. Yeah, and that opens, yeah, and that, particularly when we're talking about the football issue as well, yeah. if that were something we were talking yeah. about, yeah. you'd be able to right. so get a, a sense of that and bring okay. it to us. So. I'm, not, I'm not sure we have to then revisit the whole conversation. I think we move forward with this, and, and I'm pretty sure Kathleen will be okay with that. I don't know about Brian. Do need an hour to decide? Yeah, we've, we've made a decision, so <laughs> okay. let's just move forward. <laughs> <laughs> that was something, right? Okay, we made progress, guys. So, um, okay. hand it back to us. Next is the executive session. Can I add, before we jump to that, I did want to say one more thing. Yeah, there's really no superintendent's report tonight. I think we've done a lot of that. But I did want to mention one initiative that I started several weeks ago. I'm doing a lot of, um, spending a lot of time, walk, spending time at high school. And I plan on doing the same thing at the middle school just kind of walking through and I wanted to invite board members to join me in doing that once a week and I, I can send a schedule out to yeah, you yeah. yep and it's already created Karen has it I wanted to talk to the board about it before we put that out and I'm wondering again if are there specific board members who are available to do that and are yeah, interested you might want to make a committee for that Linda <laughs> Sam's on so many things Sam's but I already need to walked through not ad hoc Sam I know I, I'm going to be available. It would probably be it's tough hard. for you, Ryan, but are you interested or not? I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd like to do it. I'd okay. Like to be able to work through. Okay. 
Okay. Did I? I'm not sure. I can ask Brandon about his availability. Yes. I know Kathleen would probably like. <clears throat> so I've we'll already done three walkthroughs alone. Can but we I've, just like send you and say? Karen will send a spreadsheet with dates and times because yes. she what she's done is she scheduled me in once a week. Although I go more than that <clears throat> for pop in visits, but once a week specifically at different times to see different kids doing different things and seeing different staff and different programs doing different things. And I think it would go a long way and it goes to our goals as well as mine in terms of um, supporting educational programs and visibility. Yeah, I, I, I okay. would like informationally, yeah. So who are the names? Um, I, I believe it's gonna be, if I'm, Brian can't, and I'm sure, pretty sure Brandon's going to have some time constraints, but I believe yeah. the five of the rest I of us I think can one to two board them. members per walkthrough is enough because the intent is not to intimidate back with fewer students, but I think two or three of us, and, it, and the administration of the schools doesn't accompany us, it's us. Probably just one, right? Don't you think so? One not, is great. Like, you don't want to be intrusive either. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 I think that's, right. that defeats the purpose of being kind of just observers. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank um, I wanted to say that. That's so that's superintendent. And before we can we do, there's work. no consent, no curriculum, no personnel, no finance, student rep. Um, of course, we just came back from break. The school just started. Um, long, long I hope everyone <laughs> had enjoyed their holiday season and happy new year. Um, there really isn't much going on. Uh, seniors have submitted their college applications um, for counting down the days till graduation and. I know a lot of people will be interested in having a student representative at like specific topics oh, good. at the mm -hmm. committees because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I wish like some like for example the football thing. Oh, I wish I could have like had a say in that. Uh -huh. and I think that'd be really interesting. Oh, good. Okay. Um, approved. <laughs> <laughs> Items from the board. I just had one, I, it, and I know Tom and Sam can, um, will probably back me on this. We went to Layton for their assembly, and it was fantastic, and I just loved the concept of reinforcing family and belonging, and that they had adults to trust, and it was just, it was, obviously we were um, introducing the new, the new principal, but it was just a really nice event. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to point, yeah. also oh. point out that typically we do new staff introductions in December, and our second December board meeting got canceled we're, we're going to be introducing secondary new staff on uh, at the at the next january meeting and at the first meeting in february we'll be introducing new elementary staff typically we do that in december but we're a little behind a week. so that's coming Maybe. say hello to me yes Sitting right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. I didn't. Stephanie, stand. Welcome, Thank you. 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 Can use it at the meeting. Right. I know. The power they have in one hand. It's <laughs> great. Okay. Any other items I have two board? things. First of all, if these uh, walkthroughs in the buildings run through lunch, we buy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you have to eat at school lunch. School, school lunch. School lunch. Yeah. 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 That, uh, from Fulton that were on swam with the Israel girls mm -hmm. and that was very nice that they're uh, here. Uh, recently uh, in the post standard it was announced that three of our swimmers, girl swimmers, were chosen for all Central New York swim team and I'd just like to mention their names and recognize them. Sydney DeLapp who was a sophomore, uh, Sierra Tyner, a freshman, and Grace Wing, another sophomore. So that tells me that you don't have a really good swim team. Yeah. 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 I know, we gotta go back. She obviously is. <laughs> 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 that was that two things or one thing? That was it. 
The first one was lunch. Yeah, lunch. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. At this time, would there be a need for an executive session? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, reason. Um, it's two, but negotiate contract negotiations. Okay. And would there be a need for a vote after? May I have a motion? I'll move. Second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. You may move to executive session.